Hello everyone, I am Deb Schur, Artistic Director of Avalok Farm Music Institute, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to Made at Avalok, our new series created to celebrate the variety and excellence of the work Avalok has supported. Each event will highlight one or two pro projects and will include discussions with musicians about process, as well as recorded performances of completed work. So far, Avalok has hosted over a thousand musicians in hundreds of groups and including dozens of composers. We hope you enjoy the diversity and depth of the genre and approaches to the creative process which will be presented here. Before we begin, however, I would like to thank a few people. First, our administrative team, Mason Donovan and Jenna Hall. Second, our musical team, Hannah Collins, Mike Compitello, Catherine Dowling, who joined me in creating these events. And last, but certainly not least, Fred Tauber, without whose generosity, the vision and inspiration of Avalok would never have come to be. So, thank you for joining us uh, for this ongoing celebration of creative work made at Avalok. All right, hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Compatello, and I'm here tonight with a kind of mirror, which is Miki Sawada, Brendan Randall Myers, and Daniel Petro, who have an amazing project to tell us about that was sort of birthed and created and consummated at Avalok in 2018. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Miki. Miki, tell us about what you're gonna share this evening. Yeah, so a kind of mirror, before I talk about it, I have to talk about Gather Here Tour, which is my personal project, um, which started in 2017. Um, I came up with the idea after the 2016 presidential election, when I was, we were all despairing over, you know, how divided the country was and still is and I was thinking what can I do as a classical musician at that point and um, I came up with this idea to tour every state all 50 states with the piano in a van and to play classical music in community gathering spaces instead of concert halls with really like I really wanted to know what people are like throughout the country and places I might not ever get to go to and make real connections with people and also document the process so um, I did that in Alaska. That was my first tour in 2017. And um, I had kind of like a singer-songwriter format for that. I would, talk, I would talk a lot and play pretty much standard repertoire. And after that tour, I thought for the next tour, I would really like to build a concert experience from the ground up, like just completely reimagine the classical concert experience with commission music and maybe audience participation, maybe I would do something that's not piano playing. So for that, I brought on Brandon Randall Myers, composer, and Daniel Petro, who's a theater director and actor. And so together we created a show called A Kind of Mirror. And so that's what that is. And I think Daniel will tell you about A Kind of Mirror. Yeah, we, um, I had met Mickey, we met at Banff Center, I believe, the first time a few years ago. And we just hit it off and got along and, always we're talking about maybe trying to collaborate on a project in the future. And uh, during her Alaska tour, when she came back, um, she brought Brendan and I into this, this project. So we really had kind of a blank slate of what to do. And we had the advantage though of her Alaska tour. Like I knew her sensibility. I knew the heart of kind of what she wanted to do. Um, and through some conversations between the three of us, we were thinking, well, how do we make some sort of immersive classical piano concert um, in a way that's a little bit experimental, a way that really is about reflecting the communities that we go into. So we're like, how do we do that? And I remember we talked a lot about, do you remember Mickey? We talked a lot about maybe arriving early to each town or city and interviewing people, yeah. gathering stories like local stories, personal stories of the area. And then we were thinking maybe we'll have that played over the concert or maybe we'll have the people there speaking during the concert. Um, maybe I will be a host and interview people. And then it just became, that idea was a little too complex with our means, um, just with the amount of time and budget. So we really thought of how do we, I think Mickey had the idea of 
this image of, I want to have the feeling of sitting around a campfire with an audience. Like I really want us to feel like we're around a campfire and kind of telling stories and really um, connecting the community together. So we really came up with this idea of how do we have the audience participate and a creative way, but also a very simple way that doesn't make them feel self-conscious in the show, which is tricky to do whenever you have an immersive theater event. Mm -hmm. So we, we experimented with a few things, but we sort of came up with the um, setting up the playing area with a piano and there's a chair just facing the piano directly. And we would have an audience member sit in the chair at the beginning of the show and Basically, at the beginning of the concert, the audience is watching an audience member watch Mickey play. And after that, Mickey starts talking to the person like, hi, what's your name? Where are you from? And from that, she gets them to talk about their life in the town, their perspective on life in the town. And then a new audience member comes up and Mickey gives them different tasks to do. So the next person would make boil some water, make tea while she plays. And the audience watched that person. And then she talks to that person. And then a new person comes up. And as the show goes on, the tasks become a little more and more surreal and poetic with the audience. And so it was a way of really giving these little tasks and actions to the audience that create poetic story storytelling without them being conscious that they're doing that. And that's kind of what we, we got to was this immersive piano concert event uh, for that. And part of it was classical repertoire and part of it also was uh, original compositions by Brendan. And maybe Brendan, you can talk a little bit about your role composing for this and your thoughts about that too. Yeah. Um, trying to, I was like trying to remember a little bit of what my process actually was starting the pieces. Cause I remember I was like Mickey and I started talking about working together after a concert that I think I had in 2016 or 2017. And it was pretty soon after you got back from, it must've been 2017 because it was after you got back from Alaska. Yeah, I remember exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I came back from Alaska and it was such a life-changing life -changing experience. And also it took so much out of me that I felt really like postpartum depression. Right. Like, you know, it was all over and I didn't know what to do next. And I wanted to learn some music that was completely different. And so I picked up Brendan's solo piece that he had already composed. Right. And you came over to my apartment in Brooklyn, yeah. made it for you, and we went and got coffee. We talked about Alaska and you're like really into it. And so, yeah, we started talking about all this. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of the genesis of it. I think writing that first piano piece was like, I don't know. It's cool that you ended up playing that. I feel like there's a lot of things in that piece that ended up kind of becoming like seeds for the music that's in this show. Um, I think something, you know, there's, there's two sections of music that are in this first show that we made together. And one of the movements is like almost like nothing happening. It's just these like trills that go on just kind of like big chords, just these big expanding chords that happen for like, six or seven minutes or something. Um, and that was kind of like after months of just playing with drafts and doing all these like really active musical ideas and it just like hating everything I was writing. And so <laughs> there was something that I came to about just this real simplicity and really like just kind of trying to like settle into a single thing that felt kind of right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was that was actually the first thing that I wrote for the for the show and that ended up being like the first piece on the concert. Yeah, so when we came up with the concept of the show, we knew that we wanted audience participation in some significant way that had something to do with the music, but we couldn't quite come up with what, like will we have them sing something, like something clapping, making rhythm. We had no idea, like nothing was really clicking. And then we heard Brendan's music and that's when we came up with, we knew exactly what the audience needed to do. and. Maybe we can just show the video before we talk more. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's see. Let's so tell that. us what we're going to see. Um, I think the first one's the Bach can can talk. Yeah, the first one is just um, the opening flow of the concert. So you'll see excerpts from our West Virginia tour, which is where we took a kind of mirror, a kind of mirror, 
um, you'll just see the opening sequence. I talk to the audience, I play some classical standard rep, and then I talk more, um, just so you see what the audience really was like and what the shows really were like um, in person, in, in the field. And then we'll cut to bubble time, which is one of the big sections of the show. No, sorry. Tea, tea time. Tea time. Tea time first, which is one of the big sections of the show with Brendan's music and the audience is asked to make tea on stage while I play. And I'll say one thing before, you'll notice when you watch the video, the very first piece, which is the introduction of the whole concert, you know, that Bach piece, it's very gentle. It's kind of like a gentle, soft opening. And that was intentional to kind of introduce the audience because a lot of our audiences have never attended a classic music concert before or a piano concert. So there's something very classical and pure and gentle. And you'll see the way Mickey talks with the audience is also very welcoming. And we wanted to give the audience the right keys to the show right away so they know what to expect. And then you'll see it followed up by this tea time, which suddenly becomes a little bit more bizarre and a little bit absurd. So it kind of reveals right away that there's a sense of humor with the show too. And just watching an audience member make a cup of tea is so fascinating because they make it in different ways. Sometimes they offer it to people in the audience. Sometimes they drink it. Sometimes they offer it to Mickey. And so it starts to show the randomness of every concert. It makes the audience more present because they know it's not rehearsed, that it's about real people having an interaction with the music and also with Mickey. And so- it's key, so it's like, it's not intimidating. <laughs> still, yeah. still very welcoming. Yeah. If you don't have a high opinion of yourself, That's no one true. else will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, besides yourself. Like, who's your least favorite person? <laughs> I can go rock climbing, I can go hiking, 
and it's just it's such a blessing. Yeah, I've, I've com- compared and contrasted to different states. They don't compare. There's yeah. just a deep resist here. thing about West Virginia is um, I, I think this is one of my favorite things about West Virginia. <laughs> like the, the, the places where really unusual or eccentric people get together and do something interesting in a state that otherwise is often a very simple state that doesn't always have fun going on. That was really great. Thank you so much for sharing. And I love the way that um, the performance really disarms people. It sort of brings people in. And, you know, s- something that I think a lot of us are in classical music are thinking about is that sort of moat between the audience and the performer. And I, what I love about these events is the way that that's just sort of instantly not there. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of wondering how the three of you collaborated on this project during your time at Avalog. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. 
<laughs> well, yeah. we, we were there in 2018 in the fall and it was actually like a month before tours started and we had no show yet. I knew my standard repertoire. I had just gotten Brendan's music. I was learning it, but like nothing was in place and we had 10 days to make this. And it was a little bit of a gamble whether we could do it or not, but I don't know, you guys. It's just like, it's just happened. Yeah, it just happened. Yeah. I kind of, well, I got there like a week in and I remember you'd, you'd been there for about a week and like, and there were just like post-its up on the practice room everywhere and I walked in and like, I think that you, I think you figured out bubble wrap and, and like, there were like a bunch of like core elements that were in place already. Mm -hmm. I should just let you talk about making those probably. <laughs> But no, I just love walking into that. Yeah, and like, I, I, how much I, been done already. I'm really curious about uh, Daniel, how how you were involved in the project and sort of what you had seen from the experiences in Alaska and how that might have informed, you know, how 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 you struck helped structure this West Virginia tour. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I had the advantage of seeing footage from the Alaska tour and knowing the new direction Mickey wanted to take, and I'm. I have a lot of experience collaborative uh, environments where we start with an idea, but we don't know where it's going to go. Mm. Oftentimes work, you either have an idea and you, and you try to just fulfill it going, I know this is going to work or you're going, I, I'm really interested in these things and I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm going to trust the process kind of like a choose your own adventure book, you know, and you, mm. you find your way. And so this was definitely the latter of those two. And so, a big element, I remember this too, Mickey, we talked about this, was we need to listen to the music. Like we just, we, we don't want to impose something that doesn't feel true to the music in terms of adding a task for the audience. And so I remember we came up with a few things at Avalok right away. There was always that tea and coffee area. And I was like, oh yeah, tea would be a really nice, gentle sort of like a little Zen ceremony that the audience can do. And so we had note cards that I would just paste on the wall with all of these ideas and we would just change the order all the time for our time at Avalok. And so Avalok really gave us this, it really gave us this time to really uh, try different orders and see what syncs up with the music. And once Brenda arrived, um, I don't know, the sonic landscape of the piece kind of took on a new thing. and things just fell into place uh, from that. And a lot of it was about Mickey's interaction with the audience. And I remember we did some work on that about working with improv and how to keep a conversation going and not be aggressive and always receptive to whatever happens in the room. Mm. Yeah, I, just, I remember early on, Daniel asked me like, how would you like the room to feel during this show? And I think that was always our guiding, you know, kind of center idea and all these post-its we would rearrange and we would we would try like one chunk of the show every night or something um mm -hmm. and the next day we would come together again and review it and revise it and whatever but we really didn't spend that much time together as a group right like it was very it's very to the point it was very um it's quick <laughs> it, was it, was an, it was an interesting paradigm yeah. we didn't have a lot of time and we uh, needed to be efficient, but we took our time, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. We really took our time within that little window. And I remember at Avalok, we also made the decision that just visually how we set up the, the, the stage or, or the design, right. because, you know, we weren't trying to make a design heavy show with lights or an environment or set, mm. but we always had the piano on the same level as the audience. And we would have them sort of either sit around like a U-shaped. In other words, we tried not to separate the piano like on a stage mm. because we wanted this feeling of a campfire. And wherever we went on tour, if there was a piano on stage, we would move it off the stage actually and put it in the audience. So in a way that became this very interesting but very simple design too, because you don't expect the piano concert to be that intimate either. And that was something that Avalok really, uh, you know, those studios are very intimate too. And we were like, oh, this feels good being this close to, to Mickey. Mm -hmm. And we really took that with us too, with the tour. Brendan and I did a lot of your normal composer performer workshop kind of yeah. thing. We revised 
Yeah, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, especially in, in the second in the second part in Cascade, there was like a lot of just like hand work that needed to be addressed. I was watching that video of you playing that piece at roulette again, and I was just kind of like floored again. Every time I see you do it, I'm just like, how is she performing this? Like, I, and like at some point, like at the, around the three minute mark, I was like, oh my God, I'm exhausted watching this. How is she going to do this for another four minutes? Gosh, and I guess we'll, Thanks, we'll check that out a little bit later, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of curious, Brendan, did you um, compose the, the music in, in, for example, Tea Time and some of mm. the other stuff we'll see, did you compose that sort of after hearing about the circumstances, uh, you know, sort of how the setting of the concert was going to be or you know, how, how was the music... Uh, your, you know, the new compositions for this, how were they integrated into the process? Right. I, I'm pretty sure you can correct me if I'm wrong, you two, but I feel like it was, I was just kind of composing in a vacuum to some degree because I was, I was working on these months. I started the process like months before mm -hmm. we got to Avalok. Like I remember working on things kind of in like May, June, July, at least like trying to kind of fish around for ideas yeah um I think the only limitation i gave you was the technical setup yeah it couldn't mm -hmm. be too complicated because i was traveling couldn't carry much gear so his mm -hmm. pieces were piano and electronics so there's a tape part that's playing back from external speakers okay okay yeah, yeah. so i mean i uh i think next you wanted to share a little bit sort of outgrowing from your avalok experience. I, I remember hearing that when you were there, you did some test runs on, on people at Avalok. So I think this oh, next video that. is, yes, is some uh, human experimentation, right? That was really feature. the most helpful thing at Avalok was, you know, we have our Friday night shares where all the residents get together and we share with each other what we're working on. And so we actually got to test our show on the residents and get feedback. And so there's a clip of I asked Diane to come on stage. Diane is our wonderful, what is her official title? Oh, she's in charge, she's of, in charge. of everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, we know her best for baking the most wonderful cookies and giving the best hugs. Yes, that's right, <laughs> but yeah. She comes on stage and tries out tea time and it's so Diane because she doesn't want to be in the spotlight. She wants to share, you know, all the love she has. So she has the tea and she just wants to give it to other people. It's really heartwarming to watch. And, um, and then later on in the week, our show was more developed, but you know, everyone's busy with their projects. So we just kind of ask people if you have an hour and a half of your time, like you probably don't, but if you do, please come by the studio. We'll do a run for the, of the piece. And Fred, the founder of Avalok, he came and he, he tried out the show and he was very supportive and very curious and that was really lovely. All right, so let's take a look at that. Professor of Medicine, and then I became a professor of philosophy. It's quite the 
switch, or is it not? Yes, it was. <laughs> Tangentially, I was really more in philosophy of science, and I did some medical ethics, but it was not my primary interest. Uh, what is your primary interest in philosophy? Uh, well, I mean, how philosophy fails. Oh. <laughs> Can you summarize that in five words? The best thing about philosophy is that it fails. That's probably more than <laughs> all right, that was so great. And, you know, just brings us all back to our Friday evening concerts together and the, the ritual of, of tea there. So I, I'm wondering now if, if you can talk a little bit about how the, how, you know, how you ended up with the show being put together and then sort of how that experience unfolded over your tour of West Virginia. And then we'll watch some some of the more culminating areas of the of the show. So yeah, how did that go? Well, so I was obviously on tour the whole time. Daniel came with me for the first half, and then for the second half, Brendan came with me. Mm -hmm. um, so we all, yeah, they each experienced different shows. Maybe Brendan or Daniel, since you were there first, you want to talk about that? Yeah, it was super interesting going to these communities in West Virginia, and some were really out of the way places. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing we quickly discovered was the importance of community in all of these areas. Mm -hmm. And you really felt that with um, the people in the concerts. We didn't really know what sort of demographic was going to come uh, to any mm -hmm. of the shows. And it was, a, I would say, it was a pretty big spectrum of people. Mm -hmm. There was really young kids. There was really older people. There was artists. There was intellectuals. There were you know, blue collar workers, you know, it really filled the spectrum and everybody, everybody really, I think the way Mickey spoke to everybody, the way she talked with people just calmed people down and really people were incredibly appreciative mm -hmm. of the music. And they thought it was, they just thought it was cool. And like, oh, I haven't heard classical music like this. That's really cool. And then I haven't heard original composition that Brendan was writing with these electronics. And it blew their minds at times. They hadn't been exposed to something like that, nor the combining of those two elements. Um, but it was, a re it was really interesting to go on communities where art, they don't, you don't, they don't import a lot of outside art as well. Uh -huh. And I think because we came in intentionally being very sensitive to like, it's about all of you and we want to observe you as opposed to like, we're coming in, we're going to show you something and then we leave. So we came in with kind of a very different energy and a, a, yeah, we came in more with it very clearly saying the show's about all of you in these communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that really created, it created kind of a beautiful dynamic in every place I went to in the first half. Mm -hmm. What about you, Brendan? Which, what was your experience? That? Yeah, that was my reading as well. I think the, I mean, Oh, yeah. Um, You're from West Virginia. I am from West Virginia. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, there were a lot, it was, I don't know, obviously, like, I feel like this tour for me, actually, there's like a, on a just like a personal note, it kind of like, uh, I don't know what the right word is for this. It kind of like got me to reconsider <laughs> my home state a little bit. Yeah. Um, I moved away when I was 14. And then I've just like large, I've not lived there since um, and really cut myself off from it pretty like a lot for a long time. Mm -hmm. And this was a big part of kind of going back and like rediscovering a lot of things that I really love about the place actually. Mm -hmm. um, there were, I mean, of the shows that like I was present for, I think a number of the venues did have more of like, um, more, I'm not like experience. There was just like, more, there's more of a history of like importing artists from that. I mean, like the Grove gets a ton. There was like a Japanese punk band that had toured there <laughs> somewhat recently. Um, and the, actually the, the like art center, Heartwood in the Hills, which is the closest to where I actually grew up. I took like classes as a kid there. Um, they're fairly used to, I don't know, like, you know, Jude Binder, the woman that runs that space, her son is like a visual artist in New York. And, um, so when I was a kid, that was like part of like a window into the outside world for me. And it was cool to kind of be able to bring a little bit of that in. 
Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was really neat. I mean, that the show at the Grove was the first one I was around for, and it was like a really totally packed house. And like, people were just like wrapped, um, just complete like R.E.P.T. like wrapped attention, like the whole time. It was, it was pretty magical. Um, and there were like, a, I mean, I feel like every, every, every stop on that tour had like kind of as, as people have said, like the communities in each of those towns, I think are like incredibly special. And uh, like often, you know, it can just be like one couple or like one person that just like starts a space in a place and like really transforms the nature of the town and kind of creates a community around the space and the, the artists that they kind of cultivate and bring in. I mean, I, th I think what struck me, I mean, I wasn't at any of the shows, but what struck me about the videos is, is the amount of trust there seems to be, you know, and the trust, which I think comes from, you know, Miki, from you and from the, the setting and the environment and the pacing, but it really enables people to sort of be themselves. And I love these, these answers when you hear the, the audience members talking, you know, sort of how immediate and how sort of honest they are. And I wonder, I wonder if you could talk a little bit before we see some, some clips from the end, near the end of the program, how you talked about sort of, or how you thought about putting together that pacing of, of an event where, where people are basically going from knowing absolutely zero about this to sort of becoming really invested in it by the end. You know what's really funny is that this show is pretty experimental mm. um, from our point of view, but because these people had most of them had never been to a classical piano concert. It, they didn't question, you know, they really just digested everything as it came and They never thought like, oh, it's so weird that there's this contemporary music or whatever. They were just very, very, uh, what's the word, just welcoming of everything that we presented to them. And so, you know, we're starting with the one person in the chair and all these theatrics. Um, and the pieces are pretty short in the beginning. And by the middle of the show, I have transitioned more or less into a traditional classical concert. I play this big scare album piece, um, his second sonata, and there's no theatrics involved. There's no audience participation. But at that point, people are so invested in the show and they're so inside it that they, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't turn them off that I'm playing this long classical piece or whatever. They just really are able to take it in and yeah, I think that was really by design. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Daniel, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we consciously made that decision that once, you know, it's, it's funny what Mickey's saying about shows that are experimental. Like I feel everything I do is normal, but probably people <laughs> think I'm, I'm a super weirdo. Uh, 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 uh. But I work in a lot of avant-garde and your, you know, experimental forms. And it's true, if, if you don't present it that way, if you're just present with them, people will accept anything as long as you stay present with them. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, it was I'm very adamant about never dumbing down the music I play. It's not about, it's not really about slashing the concert, tra traditional concert experience or anything. I just want to be able to present classical music in a way that's not about the concert hall or about all the barriers to entry. And it's not about making a difference between contemporary music versus traditional music. I think it can just all meld together and it can, you know, it could just transcend the concert hall. So that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. Yeah, there's true. also something, I don't know, to me, there's also a thing about like the way that you curated the show that feels like you're also telling people something about yourself with the pieces that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. and the way that you've arranged them. It doesn't feel like, I don't know, I get the sense from a lot of classical music programming that it's like, I don't know, there's, you know, there's like that sense of canon or there's like, you know, this is like what music is. And to me, it feels more like an autobiographical show or in terms of like just the how, what the music that's chosen is and how it's presented. It feels more like, you know, it's like, <laughs> we made some like Mr. Rogers comparisons <laughs> when we were kind of talking about like, putting this all together and like the sitting around the campfire and it's just like, you know, Mickey's just going to like sit there and we're going to have a conversation. You'll make some tea and she'll just play some of her favorite music. And like, and I love that. That's, that's like a huge part of what kind of drew me to the project in the first place. And I loved that, we, that element of it was kind of uh, so central to the experience. 
So to wrap up the whole show, I wanted every single person in the audience to be involved because at, up till that point, it was just the person who was on stage, right, with me. And we didn't know what we wanted to do, but we heard Brendan's music, his like really virtuosic piece called Cascade with Electronics. Mm. And at the end of the piece, the piano drops out and you hear the, the track and it sounded like campfire. I don't know if that was intentional, um, but it also sounded like bubble wrap. Mm, okay. so Dave and I looked at each other and we were just like, oh. everyone's gonna pop bubble wrap. And that will be everyone's way of making music together. Yeah. And it was, it was heavily processed campfire sounds. Ah, cool. It was like wow, okay. kind of filters applied to the sounds of, of campfires. Um, I think a lot of which ended up getting some of it. I think a lot of that did stay on the track. I pared down a lot of the electronics at some point when we were at Avalok, but. Okay. Yeah, so you, you, you know, right before the, the bubble, t the bubble wrap, you have the Scriabin, which is just purely played through with no audience interaction. And we wanted to end the show to bring the audience back together again. And so they would reach under their seats and there's bubble wrap under their sheets, or we would hand them out to people. And it really was this almost childlike way of ending the show. It's like returning to play, the sense of play again. Mm. And I, Mickey would give them a cue while she's playing and the show ends when there's no more noise of bubble wrap. Mm. And so literally the show's in their hands now and they're creating that sonic landscape as well. And it, the reactions were funny. People would just giggle on all ages. And it was like, yeah, that's, that's successful. That's a successful ending for a show because it really brought people together in the same way we started the show. And, and hopefully they're in a different place now than how we began. It's very subversive. <laughs> um, I don't, I didn't, I never want my concerts to be like, you know, performer soloist on stage. You get up and applaud them and there's this big barrier. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to not be about me in the end. So that's what we did. Yeah. So why don't we, why don't we take a look at this? So we'll see the Scriabin and then yeah. the sort of the big, reveal at the end. Yeah, so the Scriabin video is um, at the Grove, which Brendan was talking about, which was one of the best shows on tour. So you'll, you'll see me playing and you'll see the venue, but you'll also see some footage from after the show. You'll see what tour, tour life is kind of like. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look.
How did you feel about that show? That was perfect. I, everything I could have asked for. I felt the same way. It was Aww. amazing. Those were such like great people. <laughs> True life of a classical musician. Yep. Yep. <laughs> this is the glamour. Gosh, yeah, that's so in incredible. I love the way the the evening can just sort of dissolve, you know, and and like we were talking about, it sort of removes that idea as the perf the perf of the performer as sort of like somebody that's untouchable. And actually, at the end, everybody who's there is the is the performer. So super amazing. So I, I'm wondering, sort of, for the three of you or for the project, sort of, what's next? How can we follow what you're up to and sort of what are you excited about uh, in the coming weeks, months, years? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh. Completely flat. Yeah. Oh, no. No, actually, um, we came back to Avalok in 2019 as a group a year ago, and we are developing uh, a show uh, more of a formal setting show maybe in a black box theater um, where the the concept, not the concept, I was talking earlier about how we always talked about how we want the room to feel during the show. Mm. So we want that to stay the same, but the content will be totally different. So that's what, what we worked on. Yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, so I mean, this show that we did last year at Roulette was, um, Kind of a bunch of a bunch of music that I had written. Um, I wrote a lot of other pieces for Miki after we finished. I finished these first two. I was just kind of like, wow, I had like, okay, I have like other ideas, and I want to just like write more stuff. So I did that, and then now there is about thirty-eight minutes of piano music, which is like slowly in the process of becoming a record. It's like Miki recorded it, and I've just been like chipping away at like 
the production end of it and like getting it kind of ready to actually be like a release. Um, but this concert that we did at Roulette was kind of like a first pass at, at like a kind of a rough format idea where um, the concert was uh, half my music for Miki and then half music that I've written for this math rock band that I play in. Um, and so there was just this really disorienting kind of back and forth. We would have like a piece by Miki and then a piece by the band, um, which, uh, so when you, I mean, you see this last video, like the band is just sitting there on the stage waiting for our turn to play. Um, and I don't know, Daniel, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you were thinking about kind of the flow and the kind of preserving aspects of the experience from a kind of mirror into this like different format. Yeah, yeah, you know, we were in roulette, we didn't have too much time, maybe a, a day or two days. And so like the limitations of a space and time, I love limitations, because you have to just, you have to figure out what's the most interesting way to present something or share something. And we're trying to think how to like, do lights change? Do they come in and out? Where are they placed in a room? And I think echoing the tour, the uh, A Kind of Mirror tour, since we don't have an audience member on stage, it's like, oh no, you should be next to each other, mirroring how we set up the tour. And when you're not playing, you just watch each other. So the audience can choose to, you know, experience the music, but also watch the other person, watch them, or watch the group, watch Mickey. And I mean, watching people watch something to me is such a, one of the most beautiful things in the world. Like, I really think when you watch somebody watch something, it's a really beautiful experience because we don't get to do that too much. You know, we're always watching the actor, the, the act person in action. Except on Zoom. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> watching yourself. We're getting a lot of experience <laughs> watching people watching people. <laughs> so so with, that in, with that in mind, maybe we should take a look at, at, uh, at this video, which is, so it's from Roulette in 2019. Mm -hmm. And it's Brendan's piece, Cascades.
Right. That was great. I mean, amazing piece. I mean, such a like blows your hair back kind of kind of piece. Amazing, insane. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing all of this. I, I mean, I wish all of us watching could have been at these events and, and experienced sort of the community that you created. But it's really great to hear about, you know, sort of how the process that you envisioned was able to play out over this over this tour. So thank you so much for for sharing with us this evening. Yeah, so grateful for Avalok. I really don't know if the show would have been made without Avalok. Yeah. Our time there. Of course, you know, everybody there misses you mm -hmm. this year and we hope that we can be together soon. And I think that if you want more information about this project or, or all of our three guests, individual and group exploits, you can take a look at the description of this video and then we'll see you next time. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.